like to describe life as, as looking at the backside of a tapestry. Looking from our side, every thread looks jumbled up as if it actually has no meaning at all. But God sees our lives from the correct side, from the eternal side. And from his vantage point, every thread has a purpose. The tapestry was woven together so that when it was completed, from one side, it would make sense and it would be beautiful. A lot of times in God's tapestry, we, we only see the underside. We just see the jumbled threads. But God sees the beautiful picture that he's creating, that he's working it all together for good. So trust his process, even when it seems painful. Sometimes it's only when the sting of a loss or a pain begins to subside that God chooses to do the unexpected and the seemingly impossible. After it seems that everything has fallen apart, only then does God reveal his greater plan. I think the school will understand what we're doing here. They won't understand and that's okay. Boys. Coach. Jordy Hank, what's his all about? We finally had our first meeting. The tent revival. Jeff set it up over at the church. I went to shut it down anyway. Because I thought Jesus would make my boys weak. The next thing you know, I'm the first one walking down the aisle, crying like a child. <laughs> My whole team behind me. My whole team. How does that happen? You gotta see it with your own eyes. Unbelievable. I'm a changed man. And I'm sorry. Fine. I will take it. <laughs> I'm glad that's over. We are gonna do camp a little different this year. Yeah? Just, uh, just a little bit different. You wanna do something? Wild, something truly rebellious. I like that. Christian if you stole my playbook now, Tanny would. <laughs> no, it would not. You know, I've always wanted two things professionally. To win a championship and to coach a truly great player. You've done both, so which is better? Rings collect dust. That right there. That lasts forever. Those two rival football teams are a microcosm of what it should be for Christians everywhere. See, churches are filled with people who, before they came to Christ, never would have hung out with one another. They were too different. But something much stronger, one common thread brought them together. And now people who wouldn't have been seen together serve together. See, sometimes we're so focused on dividing up into our camps or by colors that we forget what we learned earlier in this series. Your team should be comprised of those with diversity, loyalty, and maturity. And when the church is unified, God is glorified. One of the greatest blessings of remaining faithful to God and his purposes for revival is that you are rewarded with a powerful legacy. Those who have been faithful during movements of God have seen him accomplish the impossible through them, and sometimes even in spite of them. I'm sure the bear came and saw you gave you the ring speech. Yeah. You yeah, ain't gonna get one over there. <laughs> yeah, he did. You decided? I mean, I don't even know. I never made this big of a decision before in my life. Yeah, me too. Well, go where you feel like you can make the most difference. That's what I'm gonna do. It's crazy how these people come to see us. 
What's so special about us? We assemble. We give them hope. If you listen closely to their conversation, Jeff shared another ingredient in this recipe for revival. He says, go where you can make the most difference. And that's true of your choice of a college, but it's also true with where you work and the community that you live in, and even with your friendships. You see, revivals catch fire because of people who intentionally pour into the lives of others. And they buy into this simple verse found in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. The Apostle Paul says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. And one of the greatest blessings of remaining faithful to God and his purposes for revival is that you are rewarded with a powerful legacy. Those who have been faithful during movements of God have seen him accomplish the impossible through them. I just want to thank Coach Geralds and his team for putting this together. Thank you, Coach. Will you look at this? I mean, take a look around. Can you believe it? This is what happens when God shows up. Now, a couple years back, I went to this thing called the Explo 72 in Dallas. I joined 100,000 other people just like us. Up until that point in my life, I guess I kind of felt insignificant. I felt like my life doesn't matter. On the last night of the week, there in the big cotton bowl, they shut off the lights. And in that darkness, Reverend Graham lit a candle, a single candle. I was standing in the very back of the stadium. But I could see that light. And I realized that my life is not insignificant. My life matters. One light became two, and two became ten, and ten became a hundred thousand. Well, people in Dallas started calling the fire department and the police department, saying the cotton bowl's on fire. You know what? They were right. A hundred thousand candles burning as one. Time Magazine said that the Jesus Revolution, that's what they called us, has a symbol. This is our symbol. Because there is one way. We're not gathered here united tonight because of the name of our teams or of our schools, but because of the name above all names, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus. One person, alone in the dark, willing to speak the truth when it's not popular. One person willing to speak the truth when it is not safe. When there is much at stake. Look around you. We're not alone. This is what happens when God shows up. There's a lot of people out there, Dad. I know. But they ain't here to see Woodlawn versus Banks. They here to see you.
you've given a lot of people hope and I'm proud of you. Look at me. I'm proud of you. Win or lose, you're my son. The outcome of the game was secondary to his son knowing that, that he loved him, that he was proud of him. Those are the strong links of legacy that when they begin to connect, become a strong force. I think about all the mistakes that I've made in my parenting. Think about ways in which I look at it and say, boy, I wish I had that to do over again. But I always hold on to the truth that God is much more concerned with our direction than he is our perfection. And so while we make mistakes, we learn from them rather than live by them. You know, there was a time in my life when I was in the season that I was wrapped up in achieving success in my ministry. And rather than pouring into my wife and my small children, I was a workaholic. I was working 70 hour work weeks and my self-imposed quest to provide for my family was actually causing me to neglect them. But all that changed on one Father's Day. Before a sermon that I was to preach, a soloist got up and she sang a song and she repeated the chorus several different times. The words said, slow down, daddy, don't work so hard. We're proud of our house, we've got a big enough yard. Slow down, daddy, we want you around. Daddy, please slow down. And when she finished singing, everybody clapped and I confidently strode up toward the pulpit to preach. And I opened my mouth to speak and, and nothing came out. And tears just began to flow from my eyes. And my guilt had rendered me speechless. Someone came out and they led the congregation in a chorus while I had tried to regain my composure. Later I learned that when that had happened, our children's ministry director was in that particular service and her young son was seated beside her and he turned to his mom and said, Mommy, why is Pastor Stone crying? And Linda candidly replied, well, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin in your life, sometimes you cry. She's no longer on our staff. But you know what? She was right. And thankfully, God used the words of that song and his providential timing as a wake-up call for me. And with the Lord's help, I changed and I intentionally placed my family where they belonged, above work, but below God. And the result is the legacy of a family was forever changed. You see, your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. There are so many people who spend their lives trying to get their parents' blessing and acceptance. And fortunately, Tony Nathan's father was different. He exuded the biblical principle of giving a blessing to his child. See, a legacy is all about others. It's not about self, it's not about things. It's about a recognition that the way to impact the world is through passing the faith along to future generations. You might say, well, Dave, I've, man, I've made a mess of my life. I'm not sure that God can use me. Well, let him try.
Let's go, Let's man. Let's do this. Where are we going? You guys ready? Let's do this. Do something wild with the boys. Jordy. Pray for us, Hank. Really? Pray for us. What are we doing? Give him credit where credit is due. Let's pray. Will you pray with me? Our Father. Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Something this ain't working. Boys, just take a breath, okay? Just breathe. Look around you. Savor this moment. Okay, Mom. All right. 25 blast. Okay? Let's go do it. Let's What do you feel but you can't say? Huh? What do you want to say to all of these people? You say it when you run, Tony. You say it when you run. Now, this is your moment. This is your time. Yes, sir. So you go and take it. You go and take it. Yes, sir.
was amazing. You could feel it in the stadium all over. 42,000 fans at a high school football game. Not even the playoffs, I mean, none of the tickets were pre-purchased. They had to send home 20,000 people. You know, a National Geographic reporter who was coming through even wrote about it, and he said, it was undeniably spiritual. Supernatural, even. It was life-changing for me. It was unbelievable. So? So what? Did you win? <laughs> no, we did not. Look, I'll have these policies ready for you first thing in the morning. What? So what's the answer? Do you believe in miracles? Yes, I do. I am one. Thanks for the story. Penn State and Alabama in the Superdome in New Orleans. And this ABC Sports Exclusive. Alabama. There he is. Coach Tandy Geralds realized that in the long run, there was something far more important than getting a win. If you're serious about starting a revival, then it means that you have to use your sphere of influence to reach out to others. That means that you take some steps of faith. It means that you take some big risks. You know, if you go back to that ball game in 1974, the reporters who covered it basically all said the same thing. They said that there was something profoundly spiritual that was taking place. You see, whenever an awakening occurs or a spiritual revival takes off, it's because there is something that takes a higher priority. And ultimately, the stars of each of those teams are gonna go on to play for Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. They basically win the national championship and the story of Woodlawn and Banks and the revival and racial reconciliation in Birmingham gets shared on a national stage. Tony. Did you see it? I would not have missed it for the world. I'm so proud of you. All right, Tony! Tony! What is a big one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. oh, boy, Tony, where the foot? I don't have much time, but I wanted to tell you something. You want to ask Johnny and to marry me after graduation. That's just great, Tony. Congratulations. How's the team this year? I'm not coaching anymore. I need some time away from it. I'm selling insurance uh, right across the street from Woodlawn. Just gives me some more time with my family. All right. I respect that. Hey, go. They're calling for me. I got to go. I love you, coach. I love you too, son. Insurance sells me you are. You were born to be a coach. One of the best I've ever had. Someone once told me we all have a purpose. Maybe it's time to start living yours again. I gotta go.
Coach Tandy Geralds died in 2003 from cancer. There were a thousand people who came out to Oakwood Cemetery to pay their respects. Numerous players whom he had coached and poured into. I guess they wanted the Geralds family to know of their appreciation for his life and that his legacy was going to live on through the players and the people whom he had influenced. He was born in 1942 and passed away in 2003. He was 59 years old. The heart remembers most what it has loved best. In Tandy Gerald's case, his heart loved Christ, his family, and his players. You know, I'd love to take you to another graveyard, but it's a long ways away. It's, it's outside of Jerusalem. And besides, it's empty. It was actually more like a weekend hotel stay rather than a tomb. And that's why I believe revival can become a reality. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And you know what I think? Anyone who walks out of his own grave is whoever he says that he is. In this series, we've talked about what it takes for a revival to happen again. You choose to be on Christ's team. You've counted the cost of being a follower of His. You're convinced that His Spirit can empower you to make a difference because your identity is not found in what you do, but in who you are in Christ. And you'll experience suffering and disappointments on this journey, but God is using it for a greater good, to enhance your witness and to lengthen your legacy. I'm convinced now, more than ever, that Jesus is the only way and the only hope. There's no financial solution, there's no moral or ethical solution, and we'd say there's certainly no political solution. Someone said, the world will not be changed because of an elephant or a donkey, it will be changed because of the blood of the lamb. That's what can unite us, and that's also what can save us. And so, we pray for the Lord to sweep our nation with an awakening that would make what he did in Birmingham, Alabama look like child's play. That he would unleash his power in a fresh way, unite his followers, and ignite a revival where for too long there have been prayerless pulpits and powerless pews. So, can it happen again? Well, I can't answer that. I can't answer that for you. I can only answer it for me, but make no mistake, he can and he will if you will. You see, the height of your revival will always be determined by the depth of your repentance. And so with all the fervor and honesty that we can, may we each pray to God, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, do it again. Do it again, and let it begin with me. It's hard to believe that this is our last week, our last episode. We're joined again by, by Tony Evans. Tony, this has been a rich experience for all of us. Well, it's been fun for me, so I'm glad to be part of it. Well, thank, thank you for, for the investment of time that you've made and, and for the involvement that you have with the Woodlawn Project. I think this is my favorite episode, and it's because of the fact that legacy is something that is so important, and yet in our world today, uh, we, we don't always see the baton of faith being passed on to the next generation. What's your observations when, when you think of the word legacy? Well, of course, legacy is a, a big deal with God because he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm. He keeps talking about the legacy of his covenant being passed on. And we all know in a relay race, if you drop the baton, you lose the race. Yeah. It's that pass and that baton is critical. And yet we know many people are in situations where the baton has been dropped. But the good news is grace. That's right. Grace is where God gives you things, along with mercy, 
where he gives you what you don't deserve. And when God comes in, he can pick up that baton and give you a future. That's why I love Jeremiah 29, 11. Mm. I have a plan for you, saith the Lord, a plan for your well-being and not your calamity to give you a future and to give you a hope. What's interesting about Jeremiah 29, 11, it's a good verse in a bad chapter because everything is wrong. The families were falling apart. The economy was falling apart. The people were in Babylon because of their sin. Yep. And in a bad chapter, God gives them a great verse. Not only is it a great verse in a bad chapter, it's a great verse in a bad chapter in a bad book. Because if you're depressed, <laughs> don't read Jeremiah for devotions. That's not the book you want to read because uh, it's a depressing book. But we still got a great verse. And what yeah. God is offering people, in spite of their drop batons, just like Israel had done, mm -hmm is if you come back to me, verse 14 says, I will restore your fortune. I'm going to give you back what has been taken back from you and taken away from you. So now is the time to pick up that baton and start running again and uh, make up for some ground that, that's been lost. What I appreciate about you is that you're speaking from a vantage point where you're an inspiration to us. Uh, Tony has four kids. They're grown. They're walking with the Lord. He's got 12 grandchildren. And you have a great grandchild that's, that's coming soon. It's percolating. It's, it's percolating. percolating. Yeah. So uh, to think about how God uses that legacy and it goes on and on. And to see your kids and the difference that they're making, how God is, is using them. You know, there's that passage in, in 3 John. I have no greater joy than to see that my, my children are walking in the truth. Mm -hmm. What does that feel like at, at the point where you're at right now in life as you look at that? Well, it's exciting to know that the investment that my wife and I have made uh, in our children is paying off. Uh, our kids aren't perfect like none are, sure. but they are, they are serving the Lord. All of them are involved in ministry mm. in, in one phase or another. They're all involved in our church. They're all uh, ministering in other churches all over the country. So it's exciting to see uh, that they're carrying this on. And we just hope that as they are seeking to transfer it to their children, that it becomes a generational thing because the Christian faith is about generational transfer. That's right. That's exactly right. And, and we see that all the way through the genealogy in, in Matthew chapter 1. There's some odd names that, that appear in there. There's, uh, there's Rahab that, that shows up in there. And we're like, why, why in the world would Rahab be in the, the genealogy and the, the lineage of, of Jesus Christ and Messiah? But I think there's a message that, that God's trying to convey to us that Regardless of sometimes when that family tree is a little off kilter or a branch goes a different direction, God can still work good out of that, can't he? He sure can. And that is the good news of the gospel, mm. that when you come to Christ, he can shift the direction and the trajectory of your life, and he can make better come out of bad. That's right. And he, he specializes in that. I'd like for you to wrap up our series by, by, by talking to us just about... For those who find themselves in a situation where maybe it hasn't been the greatest lineage and maybe Christ has not been a part of it, how can they shock the system and, and break that cycle? What would you tell that person? Well, you know, in your car, you've got two pieces of glass. One is a small piece of glass called a rearview mirror. That shows you what's behind you. It shows you where you're coming from. You need to glance in that mirror from time to time to see what's behind you. But you don't live in that mirror because now you're going to have an accident. You're going to hurt somebody else or hurt yourself. Mm. Now, when you're trying to go somewhere, you're going to spend most of your time in the windshield. You ever notice how much bigger the windshield is than the rearview mirror? That's because where you're going and where God wants to take you is a lot bigger than where you came from. Mm. I know your rearview mirror may not look pretty. It may not look happy. It may not look fulfilling. And there may, may, there may be a lot of mistakes in that rearview mirror. But if I could call your attention to the windshield where God is saying he wants to take your life, renew your life, restore your life, enhance your life, improve your life, and transform your life, yeah, glance at that uh, rearview mirror so you know where you never want to go back to. <laughs> but live in that windshield because God has a plan for your life. And the best place to start, the first place to start, is repentance. Repentance is a change of mind in order to reverse a direction. Let's say you're going down the highway and it's clear it's the wrong direction. You're going down the wrong direction and you, you, you know that you can't keep going this way because you're going further wrong. Well, what you're going to do then is get off on the first exit, and that's called a confession off-ramp. That's where you agree with God you're going wrong. 
When you get off, you cross over an overpass. We're going to call that grace overpass. That's where God builds something for you to connect to going the right way. Then you get back on the on-ramp. We'll call that restoration on-ramp. So you get off on confession off-ramp. You cross over grace overpass. You get back on restoration on-ramp, and now you're headed home. Well, you know what it is to go home. You've been on a long trip. You know how long it takes to get there? But that same route coming back seems to be so much shorter. That's because coming back, you're coming home. Mm. God says, come on home. Because the trip back to me is going to be a lot shorter than the trip away from me. I have a plan for you, saith the Lord. A plan for your well-being and not your calamity. Because I have for you a future and a hope. In spite of what the rearview mirror of your life says. God bless you as you come home. Thanks for the legacy that you've left your family. Thanks for the legacy that you've imparted to us. Uh, may we follow your example as you follow Christ, and may we live in the future rather than in the past.